concerts sold out. Sporting events sold out. Theatres sold out. And even a sold out art gallery. But hang on. If you go online, there are lots of tickets for sale, some at incredible prices. 100, 200, 300, 400, 1,000 pounds, one single ticket, more than two grand. I've had to pay it because there was no other way around it, really. But yeah, it sucks. Taylor Swift is one of the hottest acts around, a nominee this week for Entertainer of the Year. Tonight, News Channel 5 investigates who's getting the tickets you want to her shows. You know, when tickets to her concerts recently sold out in minutes, Taylor Swift's people told reporters to ask Ticketmaster what happened. But a News Channel 5 investigation discovered that it may have nothing to do with who's selling the tickets. For seven months now, our investigative team has been digging into Nashville's concert ticket secrets. And Taylor Swift's concerts demonstrate how a lot of tickets may be sold before you ever have a chance to buy them. Tonight, our chief investigative reporter, Phil Williams, reveals who got which seats. To the Venus Tour 2009! What Taylor Swift and her people never told her adoring fans was what our investigation discovered, that they may never have had a shot at some of the best seats in the house. People don't want to believe that they really can't get a good seat, that they really can't get ahead of you. But internal ticketing documents show that out of more than 13,000 seats at her Nashville show, there were really only 1,600 set aside for when sales opened up to the general public. It's a secret that music industry analyst Bob Lifsitz says is never shared with fans. You know, your numbers are unfortunately incredibly realistic. You know, people would be shocked. They said, well, I saw the ad. Tickets are finally on sale, and I got a crappy seat. What happened? So it's about truth in advertising. American Express card numbers only. Taylor Swift's tour was advertised as an American Express event. What that meant was that during a pre-sale period, American Express customers had first dibs on some 5,000 seats. I think it's terrible by virtue of the fact that the public has no idea how many tickets actually go that way. You ready to get this started? And fans probably had no idea that if they really wanted a prime seat, front row section four, right in front of the stage, those seats were reserved exclusively for folks with American Express Platinum cards, or third row section two, alongside the stage, reserved for people with American Express Centurion cards. That's an invitation-only card for the very rich. That's what's wrong with this business. You know, in the 60s, rock and roll blew up. We're against the man. Now, rock and roll is the man. Country is the man. Taylor's team says it was a deal that they struck to help keep the top price of their tickets at forty-nine fifty. But on websites like Ticketmaster's Tickets Now, we found eight tickets being scalped for one hundred and eighty-three dollars each. Those seats, section four, row five, had also been reserved for platinum card holders. It's a full-time job keeping up with all the organizations I must be a member of to get a pre-sale, and it becomes an advertising thing. And I believe that is heinous. Taylor Swift's people also set aside another twenty-five seats for fans who got a special pre-sale code through her website, which sounds great. The problem is, online, you cannot tell the difference between a fan and a scalper. I'm Taylor. And that's where our investigation found the most stunning numbers. For example, two tickets on the front row section two were allocated for sale through Taylor's fan club for forty-nine fifty, but they were immediately listed on tickets now for one thousand one hundred and seventy-seven dollars a seat. <laughs> And the same thing happened with tickets allocated for opening act Kelly Pickler's fan club. That club, also operated by Ticketmaster, charges 20 bucks for a membership with a promise of access to ticket pre-sales for diehard fans. But we found seats in Section 1, Row 5, which also sold for $49.50, listed on tickets now for $749 each. Why not have all tickets go on sale at the same time? In order to have all tickets go on sale at the all time, the uh, acts or whatever parties have to agree that they don't want to take that check from American Express. They don't want to take that check from the fan club. And the acts are greedy. They want that money. 
Lips that says artists like Taylor Swift could begin to address fans' concerns by just being honest about their chances of really getting a good seat. Now, this afternoon, a member of Taylor's management team told me they had tried to come up with a system that would give fans good seats at a good price, but it just has not worked out like they wanted. He says they're now looking at some new approaches for 2011, including possibly having all tickets go on sale at the same time. Now, he added, Taylor does not condone sales of her tickets through secondary brokers, nor does she profit in any way from the inflated pricing of secondary sales. We know, and your investigation shows, that the concert ticketing system in our industry is flawed at best, and we will wholeheartedly support any legislation enacted to regulate the industry. So some real recognition. Sure. Now, just like Keith Urban, Taylor had some $20 tickets, too, to her concert. What happened to those? Well, you know, he had 389 Taylor had almost 1,000 available. However, first dibs on 750 of those tickets went to people with American Express blue cards. Now, fancy a night out with this man? When you lose reception on your phone, you tend to say hello. But it's not your thing. What about sport? None of these? Well, everybody loves Kylie. OK, three of the biggest live draws in the UK there. But if you want to see them, be prepared to pay big money. The vast majority of tickets for concerts, musicals and sports events are now sold through the online agency Ticketmaster. But often they sell out in seconds, only to be re-advertised immediately on another website at vastly increased prices. Who owns this second site and profits from the resales? That would be Ticketmaster. Helen Skelton reports. Two websites. On the left, Ticketmaster, where the very first tickets for James Blunt's latest concert have just this second gone on sale. But we can't even get a look in. Every time we try, the site says there are none available. But on the right is GetMeIn.com, Ticketmaster's partner site, where fans can exchange unwanted tickets. And look, James Blunt tickets are already going up for resale there at hugely inflated prices. There are 27 tickets available, the most expensive ticket being £148.50. £148.50? That's nearly five times the face value. It looks to me like people are buying these tickets with no intention of actually going to the concerts. They're getting hold of them for one reason, to make a profit. Nothing new in that, you say. Ticket touts have always been with us. The difference is they don't have to operate on street corners anymore. Ticketmaster, through its subsidiary website Get Me In, is giving them the means to do it completely legally and making a tidy profit from it. Ticketmaster's an American company that's grown by paying to become the main provider of tickets for live events. It now sells around 150 million tickets in 20 different countries each year. Not just for popular music shows, but classical concerts, stand-up acts and some of the biggest international sporting events. But it's pop and rock artists that attract the biggest trade. He's just lovely. He's always had that twinkle in his eye. Barbara Cowlard is a huge Rod Stewart fan who tries to see him every time he tours. So when he announced he was playing the O2 Arena, she couldn't wait to buy her ticket. Barbara logged on to Ticketmaster as soon as they went on sale, but found there were none left. She then went to GetMeIn.com, where there were plenty available, but at three to four times the face value. I was positively tearful, um, which is not like me at all, but I was so angry that they were doing this to the fans, that the fans couldn't get the tickets they wanted unless they were prepared to spend an exorbitant amount. Ticketmaster say their Get Me In site is a marketplace where genuine fans can buy unwanted tickets at a fair price. It says it's preferable to fans having to deal with touts. But if it's allowing people to resell tickets within seconds of buying them at massively inflated prices, what's the difference? And what's the company doing to stop them? Not enough. There's absolutely nothing to stop you buying your ticket on Ticketmaster or any other site and then listing it straight away on GetMeIn.com for whatever price you choose. There's no cap on the prices that can be charged. Although Ticketmaster does limit the number of tickets any one person can buy, the problem persists. 
We found a £51 sting ticket for sale on Get Me In for an unbelievable £1,208. A £111 ticket to see opera singer Andrea Bocelli for £1,760. And a £111 seat for Kylie Minogue for £1,868. That's 16 times the first value. Now, all those prices include 10% for Get Me In. The more the tickets go for, the more they make. And remember, Get Me In is wholly owned by Ticketmaster. So they're getting two bites of the same cherry. Because as well as making money on the resale, don't forget, Ticketmaster already charged a handling fee when the ticket was sold the first time around. There are no questions asked when you list a ticket for sale on Get Me In as we found out. They even let us make money from reselling a ticket to a charity event. Tom Jones, Pixie Lott and Robbie Williams all performed for free at the recent Help for Heroes concert, but we were able to profit. Buying a ticket on Ticketmaster, then immediately advertising it for sale, complete with a nice big markup on Get Me In. Don't worry, we bought the ticket back. Ironically, Help for Heroes was staged by Live Nation, which merged with Ticketmaster this year. They have strict rules on ticket reselling. You can find them printed on tickets to their events. This is the Help for Heroes ticket that we traded on GetMeIn.com. Now on the back it says, you may not resell or transfer this ticket if, in our reasonable opinion, you are doing so in the course of business. So in other words, you can't sell your ticket and make money out of it. But hang on a minute, isn't that exactly what happens on GetMeIn.com? Just to recap, Live Nation, part of Ticketmaster, say I can't resell my ticket at a profit. Get Me In, also part of Ticketmaster, let me do just that. I'm confused. So I call Ticketmaster to see if I am allowed to resell. Get me in is the one that Ticketmaster is affiliated to. Yeah, you can, you know, that's certainly one route to take, yeah. I was just a bit worried because I read on the back in the terms and conditions it says you can't resell them, so... If Ticketmaster found those tickets on eBay going at, you know, ridiculous prices and they could prove they were Ticketmaster tickets, they can cancel the ticket, yeah. So, from this conversation, the Ticketmaster position seems to be clear. They would allow me to resell my ticket for gain on Get Me In, which, of course, they would profit from. But I'd be in trouble if I tried to do the same thing on eBay. Well, there's nothing like consistency. Hundreds of Help For Heroes tickets ended up being resold at huge markups on Get Me In. Ticketmaster have told us they donated a proportion of their fees to charity. Meanwhile, thousands of tickets for other events continue to change hands in the same way. Good news for Ticketmaster, bad news for genuine fans. Well, Ticketmaster says only 10% of tickets on Get Me In are actually sold and some for less than face value. It says people who buy tickets on the site are guaranteed to receive them, so they enjoy greater protection than when buying them from some other places. As for the agent who told Helen she could resell her ticket on Get Me In but not on eBay, well, Ticketmaster says he was incorrect and now it's reviewing its training. Interestingly, we also spoke to Kylie Minogue's agent about tickets for her forthcoming tour going on sale at vastly inflated prices. He said they'd spent a lot of time agonising over what price to charge for the tickets and for other people to sell them on for a big profit is wrong. Calls for a ban on internet ticket touts have been rejected by MPs who say artists and promoters should instead be given a share of the profits. In a select committee report, the MPs say almost half of tickets are sold through online auction sites where dealers can make thousands more than the original price. Ian Woods reports. The issue united bands like the Arctic Monkeys and Take That, plus dozens of promoters who asked MPs to get tough on what have been called parasitical profiteers. It's estimated that a third of fans at some concerts have bought tickets on the black market. So what are MPs going to do? Nothing. I don't believe it is practical or sensible to say that the secondary market should be banned. It does offer real benefits to consumers, particularly for those who can't attend an event for genuine reasons and need to sell their tickets. So it's up to the music business to come up with better ways of controlling ticket supply. Organisers of Glastonbury put buyers' photos on their tickets, while Led Zeppelin fans had to collect passes for their reunion gig in person. But that didn't stop tickets being traded for vast sums. 
top of the charts last year, a Led Zeppelin ticket with a face value of 125 quid, which sold for seven and a half thousand pounds. That's not the sort of cash you'd want to hand over to a tout in a dark alley. Ian Woods, Sky News. It's now, it's the band you've always wanted to see. You get online as soon as the tickets are released, but it's already sold out. Have genuine fans really snapped up the tickets that quickly, or are ticket touts buying them in bulk so they can sell them on at a much higher price on ticket reselling websites? That's what many genuine fans suspect, and now there's a campaign to make such profiteering illegal. Josh Franceschi of the band You Me at Six went back to one of his favourite venues, Alexandra Palace in North London, to deliver his soapbox. And I should warn you that there is some flash photography in this film. Rock and roll is about breaking boundaries, about enjoying yourself. If there's one thing threatening the music industry today, it's ticket sales. I don't just mean the people who stand outside a venue. That's illegal without a street trading license. I'm talking about online ticket touts, individuals or businesses who scout masses of tickets, often using a specialised botnet software so they can resell tickets at a massive profit. When a gig is announced, Fans head to primary ticket websites, often to be told it's sold out, but most of the time they're not. It's the touts who've bought them, forcing fans to pay hiked up prices on secondary websites. These secondary websites masquerade as fan-to-fan -fan marketplaces, but as we highlighted at the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, they are all dependent upon hardcore ticket touts. One of StubHub's major clients was recently outed as a man from Quebec, who is still scalping and reselling thousands of tickets to UK events. Enough is enough. Genuine fans are being priced out of the equation. Music lovers are consumers too, and consumers have rights. In New York, legislation is in place. The UK must follow suit too. Those profiteering should face prison or a fine. It's what you need. It's what you want. It's this goes beyond consumer protection. It is about cultural access. A number of music businesses have come together to fight back with a new campaign called the Fanfare Alliance. This is an industry that is already suffering from a lack of money coming into it in other ways. If we want the live community to thrive, we need this to change. And Josh Franceschi is here now. And we're also joined by the Conservative MP, Nigel Adams, who supports a change in the law. Welcome to both of you. Josh, first of all, don't ticket resale sites provide an important service here if you do miss out the first time round? Yeah, they do. I, I, they, of course, they serve a purpose, but I think it's about uh, there being a cut-off point as to how far the, f the prices can be inflated. You know, I think there are some websites like Twickets, uh, which offer resale um, a resale mechanism, but that's at face value. Um, and there are other websites that are a little bit more, what we would say, at the fair end of the scale. I think it's the websites that are charging, you know, 20 times the, the face value price. And that is that how high it can go? And give us some examples of some of the sort of prices that tickets can actually go for. In way into their thousands. We were, mm. When we were talking to the select committee, there was a, a case study with Phil Collins. And I believe uh, it got up as high as £4,000 for two tickets to go see Phil Collins. And didn't they all get sold out in about 15 seconds or something? I mean, how can that be? Um, we've all tried. I think we have all tried to get tickets. I've tried them with a couple of iPads and I've failed recently to do it. Um, shouldn't there be technology that stops people buying in bulk? Well, there is. Lots of the primary ticket companies um, do have technology in place to try and stop it happening. But it's an arms race, a technological arms race, and, and the and the touts uh, are very good at it. They they have these bots which attack ticket sites and hoover up hundreds and thousands of tickets, and within seconds they're for resale on other sites at inflated prices, and and that's why I want the law changed. Right, but will legislation do what you want it to do in this instance if it is actually about a technological arms race? Well, I, I believe it will. Uh, Josh <laughs> Do you has not? Been, Josh has been fantastically supported, by the way. This is a guy uh, who took it upon himself to sell his tickets direct ah. to his fans across a counter in a shop. But there is a, there is a problem. It's not a silver bullet. Banning these bots and making it an offence isn't going to solve the whole 
problem. But they do it in the States, in certain states. In America, you can now go to prison. I want to make it an imprisonable offence as well. Um, but it's, it's a step in the right direction, we believe. There are lots of other things that need to be done as well. Do you support that, then? Yes. You do? Yeah. Um, really, to go, for people to go to jail in these instances, for there to be prison sentences, do you think that will work in terms of deterrent? Uh, I think it will definitely work as a deterrent, but, I mean, if it, this isn't about me trying to go around and lock people up. This is about trying to get the situation as it is changed for fans of live music, because on a daily basis I interact with our fan base, whether it be face-to-face -face or through social media or what have you, and a lot of them are being priced out of the equation, and that's really my fundamental issue with it. Right, and actually the ticket resale company that you mentioned, I think, in the film, StubHub, um, gave us a statement saying they support legislation to tackle bot misuse, as they call it. The misuse of these programmes harms all aspects of the ticketing industry, most importantly fans. And we've consistently supported anti-bots legislation and recently gave evidence to the US Senate Commerce Committee on this subject. And this is one of the biggest issues that the ticket industry faces. Um, they do go on to say that legislation alone can't solve it. So what else needs to be done? I think we need to certainly be looking at how tickets are released. I think in some um, cases you'll have artists and managers that might be complicit in this racket. I mean, touting's been going on mm, since yeah, the Romans have been exactly. putting on shows yeah, in the Colosseum. Yeah. But, you know, we're not going to entirely wipe no. this away. But we need, to, we need to take some action. I think, I think having this as an offence is, is a, a right step in the uh, right direction. Right, what do you think? Is it a good idea? Yeah, sound, sounds exactly right. I mean, it's, it's about striking a balance, isn't it? Because nobody wants to stop the process of being able to sell on a ticket that you might not need any longer, mm. and even actually getting a little bit of a margin for it. Yeah. So it's about balance and make, making sure people can't profiteer about on it. And in terms of industrial-scale hoovering up of tickets, I mean, surely that's crime. Right. I mean, and what do you think? I mean, in a sense, is it a pressing issue for you? Is it something that should be dealt with? Yeah, I think so. I mean, along with the work that Nigel has done, my colleague Sharon yeah. Hodgson for Labour has been job. campaigning on this for a long time as well and that's because for our constituents this really matters. It's not just the fan experience but as you said in the film it's also that this then strangles an industry that is really really important for Britain and brings a huge amount of pleasure to a lot of people and these people are parasites and they ought to be dealt with so well done for doing it. And have you tried to get tickets either successfully or unsuccessfully? Have. I've been unsuccessful. You've yeah. been unsuccessful. I got my Britney <laughs> tickets. You did? But I had to use three phones to do it. Did you? Yeah. How long did it take? Uh, not long actually. I got through within about 20 minutes Three phones and, and no box. I can <laughs> confirm she was brilliant. <laughs> so it was worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. I lost out on Worth Kate Bush, penny. you see. Should ministers get behind um, this? Absolutely. I know um, Karen Bradley, the Culture Secretary, takes this very seriously. She's having meetings today uh, regarding the law enforcement angle of this. I'm meeting with her on Wednesday in a round table at the department with uh, industry representatives. I think we've got a real opportunity. Um, we're debating it today as well in the report stage um, of the Digital Economy Bill. I think there's a real head of steam. It's a cross-party supported issue. The only people who presumably are not in favour of this are the Stan Flashmans of this world and these big-time villains ripping off genuine music fans. Right, and so you're confident that this is going to happen and it'll make a difference? I am, yeah, and I'd also like to say that I think more artists should be speaking up for their fans on this issue. Um, it's, it doesn't take much, really, to put your name on something, and I think this is something worth putting your name on. Um, but, yeah, we are confident it's going to get passed. Thank you to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Two dispatchers reporters have been undercover inside major companies who run what are known as fan-to-fan -fan ticket exchanges. They say they're websites where real fans can resell tickets they can no longer use. But we found promoters allocating tickets for the biggest gigs to be sold at large markups. We have to keep it secret and not tell them because, like, it's really fucking shady. Okay. We found professional ticket resellers operating through sites supposedly run for fans. I mean, all this information, we don't know anything about it. Yeah. That's absolutely like, because of the, that's the kind of things that they don't want anyone to know. We even found one company buying tickets themselves and then selling them, something they claim they don't do. Is that what all the credit cards are for then? Yeah. For the buying of the yeah. Ticketmaster. Yeah. Sold on secondary websites, places where people can resell their tickets. The websites which cause this controversy say that the prices are set by the sellers. Some can be astronomical. Here is a ticket for the West End play One Man Two Governors. The seat is on the very back row, and the seller 
is asking for £400. Just one ticket. If you're into rugby, I can do you England versus Ireland at Twickenham. The cheapest seat is £400. Most expensive, £1,000. And finally, you may want to sit yourself down for this one, just one ticket for Band of the Moment Coldplay, £2,292. I mean, they're good, but two and a bit grand. So who's selling these tickets, and how are they listing them so fast? It's hard to know, as the sites keep the sellers anonymous. But music fan Julie Watson from Glasgow has a hunch. Three years ago, she says she found something strange going on. She queued up outside the box office at the Clyde Auditorium to guarantee she got a front row seat for Will Young. It was a tour promoted by the biggest live events company in the world, Live Nation. Although she says she was first in the queue, she got a nasty shock. When the box office opened at 9 o'clock, the chap behind the desk immediately told us um, we couldn't have anything centrally in the first five rows because they weren't available. He then informed us the reason for this was the fact that tickets had gone to a company called Via Gogo, which I'd never heard of before. So Julie says she looked on the Via Gogo website and saw the front row tickets listed there for sale. They actually had the tickets for the ones that I tried to get that morning. I think at that point we're selling for about double the face value. Julie says she was determined to find out more. She bought a £35 face price ticket from the Viagogo site, costing her nearly £60, including fees. As it was close to the gig, she was told by Viagogo to pick it up from the box office. And then she saw something strange on the ticket. Viagogo's name is actually where you would expect to see the name of the person who's bought the tickets. But how can that be? If you open up the via GoGo website here, it tells you it allows fans to buy and sell tickets. But if what Julie says is right, front row seats had gone straight to via GoGo and had been sold to the public at over face value. That doesn't seem to add up. So what's going on? Well, we went undercover inside via GoGo to find out. The company says it's Europe's largest ticket exchange, selling tens of millions of pounds worth of tickets every year. They employ more than 100 staff at their London offices. And our undercover reporter, Paul, has been given a job in customer services. He'll be dealing with emails from members of the public who've bought tickets sold through the site. But first, it's a few days of training about how the company works. Paul's told some sellers through the site are ordinary fans. But he's also told that many tickets aren't coming from other fans, but from another source entirely. We have um, allocations, for example, um, for very big events, Vienna, uh, Westlife, let's take that. We are getting allocations from the promoter, so we are allowed to sell them on our website with our internal accounts. So on this one, um, the seller is basically us. Yet this isn't how the public has been led to believe that the system works when a big tour goes on sale. Promoters distribute tickets through what are known as allocations. And we're told these allocations normally go to so-called primary ticket agents, like Ticketmaster, to be sold at face value. But this manager is saying that some promoters are also giving allocations to Viagogo, even though it says it's a site where people buy and sell tickets to each other. In a training session with his team leader, Paul's told more. We have a whole primary team that deals with the uh, promoter and with the venues and with the box office and we have some deals with them. Okay. So we get tickets directly and they deliver all the tickets to us. So okay. She says Paul is not to pass on this information when he's dealing with the public. I mean, it's really important that um, we never communicate to anyone that these accounts exist and that we do have tickets. Okay. Because um, that's something internal that they're not supposed to know. And they, as far as we're concerned, we're a ticket exchange and we don't own any tickets. Okay. And he's told what to say if anyone outside the company guesses what may be going on. But we don't confirm it, we don't deny it, we just don't comment on it. We just say, we'll speak to the seller and let you know. Okay, yeah. 
Paul is told Viagogo has a whole team dedicated to arranging these deals. Then there's another team which gets the tickets into the office, then ships them out. While Paul's working at Viagogo, a big gig comes up. Cold play at the O2 Arena. It's promoted by SJM Concerts with another promoter called Metropolis Music. And it's the tour which has been causing outrage over how quickly it's sold out. Paul learns where at least some of the tickets went via GoGo had an allocation. His team leader shows him the internal accounts the tickets were sold through. The accounts are given names of people who work at via GoGo. For example, Coldplay Seller Plus Merit at Vigo. Okay, yeah. Those are our primary accounts. Yeah. I mean, it's really the name on the account which she mentions, Merit, refers to Merit Bear. This is him in the office, and he's a senior manager in their primary team. Later, Paul films the listings and transactions for this account as he does his job. He can see that lots of allocated tickets for the O2 gig were sold to fans at way over their face value. An ordinary seat in the lower tier was face value £65 plus booking fee. But via GoGo sold them at sometimes more than £200. This person paid £542, including fees, for two tickets. Now the seats are near here, and at £271 a ticket, well over three times the face value, it is an awful lot to pay when you're this far away from the band. In the primary account his team leader showed him, Paul can see that over 1,800 tickets were sold for nearly £230,000. That's around £123 per allocated ticket. After the gig, Paul gets further confirmation that the public is not told about allocations like this. Coldplay are playing again in 2012, and he finds they have an allocation for this tour too. He takes a query from a customer to Merit Bear, a senior manager on the primary team. You're, you're Merit, aren't you? Hi. The customer wants to know where his seat will be, as it's not made plain on the website. Again, Paul is given instructions not to say where the tickets have come from. Uh, so, do you know, what do you reckon we should tell the buyer when they Do not tell them their primary tickets, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, that um, the exact seat locations will not be available till January. OK, thank you. No worries. Christmas is around the corner and the whole team goes for a meal in London. Paul gets to find out a lot more about how these allocations work. As staff chat outside, he meets this colleague. He says his job is reporting the sales figures for some of these allocations. So what do you, what do you guys do? Like whenever we get like primary allocations, so to speak, you know, like from like Nation or whatever, then we list the tickets, basically and then price them, and that's pretty much it. It's usually Live Nation or S, like S, yeah. SJM. Is that like a or something? Yeah, yeah. Live Nation or SJM, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's usually one of those two. But... Live Nation is the biggest live entertainment company in the world. And SJM Concerts promoted the Coldplay gig at the O2 Arena in December, along with Metropolis Music. He explains how the deals work. And so why, how come they give us tickets? Because we give them a split or something? Or like... Yeah, yeah, basically we give them like a 90-10 split, so they get their face value and they get 90% of whatever we make they get, it. They get 90% of it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we, obviously we get like the 15% booking fee, that's ours. Yeah, OK. Um, so like, it's, we sort of win. It depends on the allocation. If it's like 20 tickets, yeah. there's no fucking point because you're not, there's no money in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if it's like 1,000 tickets, then we get 15% of whatever the face value is. And that's like, it's yeah. good money. So what are, the, what, are the big, what are the big gigs that you've... Um, like this year, Coldplay's been ridiculous. Like, so how many tickets do you get for Coldplay? Yeah, yeah. Like we've got like a thousand a day. A thousand a day, OK. okay. Via GoGo claim that the prices on their website are not determined by them but by the seller. But according to this colleague, it's Via GoGo managers who are setting the prices for thousands of tickets. Who decides how much to sell them for? 
just play it by ear, really. Like, on the on-sale, we just, like, mark up to a ridiculous extent because people panic on the on-sale. Like, things are sold out immediately, so they're like, bye, 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 bye. Yeah, yeah. But then, like, over time, that drops down, obviously, because there's no demand all of a sudden. Yeah. And then just it just, like, we have three or four times a week, like, about all of our allocations, how they're doing, and then it's like, roll. Well, like, we've had 2,000 visits. We've not sold a single ticket. We should probably lower the prices, like, that okay. sort of thing. He says if sales are going well, though, they increase the prices. Whenever they come through sales, I get the emails so that I know if they're selling well to raise the prices or right. whatever. Do you reckon the artists and the venues like, know about it? Or? No. Well, so, like, I'd say maybe 50% of the venues know about it, but then a lot of the time we have to keep it secret and not tell them because, like, it's really fucking shady. Like, yeah, we're, okay. we're, we're making a lot more money than we ever should on this. Right, OK. After a few weeks of work, Paul volunteers for some overtime and is asked to take a laptop home with him. OK, cool. Perfect. And he sees this document on the system. It shows Viagogo had an allocation for the V Festival last summer. This was organised by SJM Concerts, along with Metropolis Music and MCD. It shows Viagogo were allocated over 4,500 tickets. The tickets they sold had a face value of £620,000. But they sold them at nearly £900,000. That's a quarter of a million pounds over face value. It says nearly all of this, £884,000, was passed back to the promoter. Paul also finds that Viagogo had an allocation for the biggest tour in recent times. In October 2010, there was a big announcement. Take that, I'm going back on tour. Yay! Demand was huge, with people queuing overnight at the box office and bombarding the internet and fans. Stephanie Loxton says she went online the moment they went on sale. So tour's announced, yep. you're there prime with a credit card, what happens next? I just couldn't get hold of the tickets. I was there just before 9 o'clock when the tickets were due to go on sale and um, there were just no tickets available. Yeah, As so often happens with big gigs, the tickets turned up on secondary sites. So you go to these other sites and you see, take that tickets up for sale for way more than face value. What are you thinking? When a ticket goes from £50 to £150, £200, I have my limits. <laughs> And I just thought this is ridiculous. Someone's clearly making money out of this. And there's a lot of people out there who do who are, you know, diehard fans that actually couldn't get to go because of the greed of others. Paul finds out what the fans didn't know. Via Gogo had their own allocation for this tour. These are some sales for their concert at the Stadium of Light in Sunderland. Standing and unreserved tickets, face value £55. They sold these particular ones for around £100 to £125 each. In the accounts Paul sees, they sold over 29,000 tickets for £3 million, an average of more than £100 a ticket, a long way over the face price. At work, Paul gets access to another document which reveals more about the scale of allocations. Now, that document was a list of big events, mostly for this year, in the UK, and it says that Viagogo has deals to get allocations of tickets for them all. It lists nearly 50,000 tickets they've been allocated for 50 well-known acts, music events, sporting occasions and the like. Strictly Come Dancing. Among the events are 800 tickets for the live show of the BBC Strictly Come Dancing. It's promoted by Phil McIntyre Entertainment and Stage Entertainment UK and glossily advertised on this website. Disaster. Also on the list, 800 tickets for the live tour of The X Factor, promoted by 3A Entertainment. 2,200 tickets for Rihanna's UK tour. And over 3,000 for Westlife's 2012 tour, both promoted by Live Nation. The biggest allocation of them all, it's Coldplay. 9,000 tickets for their upcoming stadium tour. After we finished filming Undercover, we went to meet Sharon Hodgson MP. Now, she's been raising concerns over the secondary ticket market ever since she had a bad experience four years ago. It all began with my daughter one day trying to find tickets for Take That 
Tua and the tickets were all sold out and then continued searching and found some on the secondary market marked up quadruple the price up to 400 plus pounds a ticket the unfairness of it just hit me straight away since then she's been campaigning for more regulation for the resale of tickets we've been undercover in Viagogo what we have found out is that for the take that tour last year they were given a direct allocation they got hold of 29,000 tickets they sold them for I think an average of 100 pounds beyond face value of some of the tickets. That is absolutely disgraceful, and I'd be surprised, very surprised, I would hope Take That did not um, give permission for that to happen, because some fans queued for hours, and if all that there was an allocation being given, it's just not fair. How can the secondary websites be given an allocation of tickets directly that the fans understand that the tickets all go on sale to them first? They've got even less of a fair chance to get them if some are being given directly to via Google, it's just not right. We found no evidence that any of the artists are aware of the allocations. We approached the promoters of the acts for which we had evidence of allocations. Phil McIntyre Entertainments and Stage Entertainment UK confirmed that they had given an allocation for the Strictly Come Dancing tour to Viagogo. They said that Viagogo came well recommended by other promoters in the industry and was selected in good faith. Live Nation, SJM Concerts, Metropolis Music, MCD and 3A Entertainment are members of the Concert Promoters Association. The association told us it was concerned about the fraudulent listing of non-existent tickets online. It said that promoters putting tickets onto the secondary market brought prices down, while ensuring that some of the tickets in the market were genuine, it said. In this respect, the secondary market is effectively being used as a premium price primary market for those fans who wish to use it for convenience. It said those fans would be happier that the premium went to the artist via the promoter rather than went to a tout. While Paul was undercover, he found another practice which the public isn't told about. Viagogo says it's not the seller of tickets on its website and all tickets come from third parties. But on the desk of this supply manager, Paul spots a book containing credit cards. Bloody hell, you going Christmas shopping? Yeah, it's all right. Pretty good amount of cards, isn't it? At the Christmas dinner for Viagogo staff, Paul asks him about it. Do you have to buy all the tickets, like... If, if, up, if we don't have an allocation, then we do buy them, yeah. OK. But, um, which is, like, highly fucking immoral, but, you know... We're well, buying them. So, yeah, and then, like, you're reselling them for double the price, because we just bought them off Ticketmaster. Right. As soon so as nice. the 9am pre-sale comes on, like, just on sale comes on, sorry, just get on Ticketmaster and buy them like a normal person would, but because we're Or just there, your because, team. Just yeah, you. because that's our job to buy them, then we always get, like, first dibs, essentially, because... As he works, Paul starts to suspect that the transactions where they're just buying and selling tickets themselves go through an account called Inventory. The next week, he asks the same supply manager what the Inventory account is all about. The inventory ones are ones that we didn't have an allocation for. Okay. Now, and you what? And so we bought them off the ticket master or whatever mm -hmm. and resold them basically. Is that what all the credit cards are for then for when you. Yeah. For the buying of the yeah. ticket master? Highly, highly immoral. Brilliant. Ticketmaster limits the number of tickets you can buy on one credit card to stop bulk buying. But the supply manager says Viagogo uses a number of credit cards all registered to different addresses to get round the system. It's usually a maximum of six. Six, OK. Per person, per address, I guess. But, um, yeah, that's why we've got so many, so we should get... Do they not realise they're all from the same address? Like, all the billing addresses for the cards are our own houses. Yeah. If they go into the same address, then Ticketmaster will cancel the card. How oh, right, so you, you, everyone puts personal address yeah. down? Yeah, oh. basically. Because like, the address I'm at right now is registered to my dad's address, and my mum's address is completely different, so... OK. Two addresses. Two. So you can get double... double all the fun. Yes. The fun. We told MP Sharon Hodgson about this. That is shameful. That is a total misrepresentation of what the Agogo say that they do. It's no wonder people can't get tickets when they go on sale. You know, you're up against people sitting there with multiple credit cards doing it as a job 
for a so-called legitimate secondary website, it's disgraceful. After a couple of weeks undercover, Paul is asked to move to a new team. Okay, I'd like to ask you if you'd be okay coming to the side of the team. Yeah. Viagogo describes itself as a fan-to-fan -fan website. And they do have what they call fans, or individual sellers, who sell a small amount of tickets each. But Paul is now joining a team which concentrates on helping another level of sellers entirely. Viagogo calls them power sellers, or brokers. The sellers are kind of partners, suppliers to us. Yeah. So they know us and we know them, they know our names, and we deal with them with the same people every day. The team leader tells him that many of them are large-scale operators. And then there's professional sellers that are actually doing it full-time and they have staff and employees and they actually have a company. Some of them have affiliates to the primary market. And some sellers, they have allocations. Um, because they, they have a contact in the venue or something? Yeah, yeah. They, ha they have a contact or they actually own a box. <laughs> they own a certain part of the section. Um, there are sellers that actually have a primary machine in, in their office <laughs> where they just print tickets. But Paul is told never to divulge this to the members of the public he's dealing with, not even to other colleagues. I mean, all this information, we don't know anything about it. We never... No, 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 no. no. Like, even, like, two people in the bar team, even, like, no, that's no, absolutely, like, no, no, no. because of more, that's yeah, the kind of things that they don't want anyone to know. Like. But in some sense, they... Another colleague tells him to keep it quiet that there are professionals selling through the site. Just say, just say broker or power seller. Yeah. <laughs> We don't want you to like, give information that they are like sort of professionals that have loads of tickets and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just a ticket exchange for individual people. So just maybe say frequent sellers with a good rating. The Viagogo website doesn't give a breakdown of the kind of sellers who list tickets, though it has made some public comments about it. This is what Viagogo said to a financial website last year. The overwhelming majority of sellers on Viagogo are ordinary sports and music fans who are trying to sell on tickets that they can no longer use. Well, it might be true that the majority of sellers through Viagogo are ordinary fans, but we've discovered that fans definitely are not responsible for the majority of ticket sales. We know this because Paul's team leader showed him the sales figures for November last year. And those are for the amount of how many, how many transactions there were. So the biggest thing is power sellers. The biggest thing is power sellers, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Out of a total of 38,000 transactions that month, 11,000 were by power sellers. 10,000 primary, so they were tickets sold by Viagogo themselves. And only 9,000 were by fans. So fans were responsible for less than a quarter of the sales that month. Secondary websites like Viagogo have obligations to be fair with the public under consumer legislation. Professor Christian Twig Flesner specialises in this area of the law. I showed him the evidence we'd gathered at Viagogo and asked him for his expert opinion. What's your reaction to what you've just seen there? I am very surprised by what I've just seen because this seems to be painting a completely different picture from that which is presented to those who go onto Viagogo and, and buy tickets on Viagogo. Does it contravene any element of legislation in your view? It does, yes. Um, we don't have specific legislation on ticket resales, but what we do have is a fairly new piece of legislation to protect consumers against all sorts of unfair commercial practices, unfair trading practices. Now, in this case, we see a lot of evidence that Viagogo is involved in misleading practices. They're presenting tickets as being supplied by fans when they're supplied by Viagogo, um, the prices for those tickets are not set by fans, but at least in some cases set by Viagogo directly. A lot of this seems to be a misleading commercial practice under these regulations. We approached Viagogo for their response to our findings. For their response to our findings. They told us... Viagogo exists to provide a safe, secure marketplace for the buying and selling of live event tickets. Viagogo is an open marketplace, and while the majority of sellers are individuals, we do not disallow larger sellers, including event organisers, from selling on our platform. Above all, we provide a guarantee that buyers will get the tickets they have paid for, which has helped dramatically reduce ticket fraud and scams in the UK. Alongside Viagogo, another company in the UK calls itself the biggest secondary ticketing exchange in Europe. 
Seatwave says it has more than a million tickets on its website at any one time. So when you go onto the Seatwave website, you are told it's Europe's largest fan-to-fan -fan ticket exchange, an online marketplace where fans, that word again, can buy and sell tickets. So if you're at home going onto this website, it would be a fair assumption the sellers of most of their tickets are fans. But we had gathered evidence that many of the tickets being sold through their site were coming from professional resellers. Last summer, our second undercover reporter, Katie, got a job as a part-time ticket agent to find out what was going on. Her manager is called Lee Lake. Mm -hmm. it's a little bit wet. Thanks. He explains the different kinds of people who sell tickets through Seatways. We kind of categorise them in three ways. You have what we call a consumer, which is one or two time sellers who maybe someone can't go and sell a ticket or sell two tickets. So that's yeah. what we call a consumer seller. Consumer sellers are what Seatwave concentrate on in their adverts. Last year, they said in an interview with Sky News, 99% of people who have ever sold tickets on Seatwave have sold fewer than five tickets. But Lee Lake admits they have two more categories besides the consumers, which they don't admit to in their marketing. Then we have what you call like pro sellers. So these guys would be maybe someone who work, works somewhere else full time, yeah. at a bank or wherever, and are actually selling quite a lot of tickets. Mm -hmm. And then you have brokers who just sell tickets as their job. So are they touts? Probably some form of tout, yeah. Maybe online touts. He makes plain that these professional sellers, or touts rather, are important to the company. Obviously, I've got the links with the brokers, so I'm just constantly speaking to people saying, like, send me this, send me that, send me this. You know, yeah. Just recognising who the, who the kind of key sellers are. It's those are the people who are constantly, like, wanting to get stuff up and be shown a little bit of love. Cause yeah. Although they might be a pain in the arse, they're actually paying our salaries. Because right, if, they yeah. don't, if they don't put their tickets up, we don't sell them. If we don't sell any tickets, we don't earn any commission. So. Okay, thanks a lot. Lee Lake has been at the centre of some controversy. In 2008, the O2 Arena banned him from their premises after they found him handing out tickets to buy us for a Coldplay gig. They found he had bought the tickets using multiple credit cards and multiple addresses, and they'd been sold through the Seatwave website. Seatwave told the media that Lee Lake had bought the tickets, but it was only in case the company needed to replace missing tickets for customers. But on Katie's first day, Lee Lake tells her something which the public wasn't told. Just about me, I've been over here working for about three and a half years. So before that, I was doing tickets on the side. So I kind of got bored with my job and met her got to know a guy here because I was selling tickets through Seatwave yeah. and then continued doing that. So I, I still kind of sell lots of tickets, which kind of makes me know about my job. Katie starts work in the last minute ticket section. She's part of a system under which people can continue to sell their tickets through the site right up to the day of an event, as long as they bring them into the office. She's told lots of tickets for last year's Take That tour were bought up by brokers and they ended up trying to sell them at the last minute. Take That was absolutely mental. There's been a few... How come there were so many last-minute tickets for Take That? Just Once people... again, I think brokers, a lot of the brokers, you know, something as massive as that, they just buy hundreds and hundreds of tickets. Yeah. And then they just have too many, and, you know... The, the, we, I was... We were binning sort of 40, 50 tickets a night. On Friday and Saturday, there was like maybe five or six tickets left, but there was one night that I came back with a folder full of tickets and they were all unsold. And it's like, it's really... So they just buy loads of tickets. But they make so much money on the ones that they sell that they yeah. still kind of make a profit anyway, it doesn't matter. And it's this colleague who's been assigned to show her the ropes as he's been doing the job for a few months. At lunch, Katie asks him about the branding of Seatwave as fan to fan. It's not fan to fan, is it, if it's brokers? I don't think people are supposed to know that. Oh, really? He says when they deal with the public, they don't tell them that they're buying from big sellers. Yeah, you either say, well, we don't know, we're just, we're literally just some computers that's in the middle of it. Um, and if they wanted a name, then you'd you know, say it's.
whatever. You wouldn't go, oh, he sells loads of tickets. <laughs> Recently, this video surfaced on YouTube. It shows the CEO of Seatwave, Joe Cohen, presenting to colleagues and investors at an internet industry conference in 2010. And here he gives a makeup of the sellers on Seatwave. The economics and, and, and the makeup of, of our sellers. Um, we've got large brokers who are, who are people who are taking vast amounts of supply and inventory, selling tickets professionally. The figures say brokers list over two-thirds of the tickets on Seatwave and make up nearly half of the sales. And another category of seller isn't fans either. We've got consumer sellers and then we've got event organizers who are trying to yield, manage and sell unsold inventory as well within our exchange. So ticket sales by fans, who they call consumers, are a minority. They sell just over a third of the tickets. But when you go on the Seatwave website, you're not given any of these figures. The website just says anyone is free to sell legitimate tickets on Seatwave. It gives no details of who the sellers are, and there's no mention of brokers or event organizers. We showed our evidence to Professor Twig Flesner and asked his opinion on what we'd found. So there you go, Seatwave, mm -hmm. claiming to be Europe's largest fan-to-fan -fan ticket exchange. What did you see? Um, something that doesn't seem to be involving a great deal of fan-to-fan -fan exchanging, but rather business-to-fan exchanges. We see that l less than half of the tickets sold are from real fans. Um, we're seeing that the majority of tickets come from professional outfits. Once again, consumers are being misled. That is clearly not acceptable under consumer protection rules. Katie only worked for nine days at Seatwave. Her undercover role was compromised and she was fired. Last month, Seatwave changed their branding so their logo no longer says fan-to-fan. -fan. But the fan-to-fan -fan description is still on their website and they still carry their advert on the site. We approached Seatwave for their response to our evidence. Seatwave denied that they had breached any consumer regulations. Its CEO, Joe Cohen, told us... Seatwave was set up five years ago to help fans get better access to events at market-based prices and have complete peace of mind that the money they were spending on tickets was secure. Along the way, we have led the industry in the areas of consumer protection and transparency, and we will continue to lead the way in providing fans better access to the events that they are passionate about. We will continue to do so in a fair and transparent way. The resale of tickets online is now thought to be worth up to a billion pounds a year. And the activities of resellers are branching out from the traditional rock and pop gigs. Last year, the National Gallery's Leonardo da Vinci exhibition sold out, with people queuing round the block for on-the-day tickets. But the gallery publicly complained about resale websites after the £16 tickets were being advertised online for hundreds of pounds. Reselling has even reached that great British institution, the last night of the proms. Peter Robinson makes a huge effort to get a ticket when the proms go on sale every year. He takes the first train from Ipswich to London and queues at the box office from 8 in the morning. It's not just the music, it's the people who you meet. It's one big picnic. Peter was lucky and got a ticket last year, but many didn't. They had to queue for hours on the last night itself for first come, first served, standing tickets. And some were turned away as it was full. No more tickets to sell. If I could ask you to go home, watch it on television, listen to But tickets were changing hands online for huge markups. Peter spoke to the person sitting next to him. And he said to me, guess how much we paid? So I said, two to three hundred. And he just went, I said, four hundred. He went, he told me that they paid, I think it was fifteen hundred and ninety pounds for three last night's seats, which is frightening, really. The proms are the crown jewels of, of our music season. And uh, I, I believe they should be protected, but um, people are making big money out of it. Reg Walker is an independent consultant who specializes in security for major venues around the country. One of his jobs is to tackle the unlicensed resale of tickets. 
He says the online market has transformed the traditional face of the street corner tout. Since the advent of the internet, it's become much more of a cold, cynical harvesting of tickets for events um, with the use of limited companies, multiple credit cards in multiple names. It may be done by sending people to various box offices. It's, it's an industrial scale. And in my opinion, it simply is immoral, unethical and disadvantages the very people in society that cannot afford to pay through the nose for tickets. It's currently legal to resell a ticket online unless it's for football or the Olympics. Five years ago, a House of Commons Select Committee considered whether the secondary market should be regulated. Joe Cohen of Seatwave and Eric Baker, CEO of Viagogo, went before the committee and defended the secondary market as being in the interests of the consumer. The committee decided against regulation. But MP Sharon Hodgson is one politician who thinks the time has come to look again at the industry. Last year, she tried to bring in a private member's bill to restrict reselling. Well, what I want is that these tickets can only be resold at, say, face value plus a small percentage. So anybody with a ticket, you know, for an event and they find they can't go, they would be able to resell it on a secondary website. But if you take the profit out, people won't deliberately buy them up in huge numbers in order to resell at a profit. While Paul was undercover at Viagogo, its founder and chief executive, Eric Baker, came to give a talk to all the staff. This is the year that we clearly established that we're the dominant player in Europe. If we continue to deliver on, you know, doing the deals, uh, developing the product, uh, where we want to own the entire uh, world. So we're trying... So Paul asks him about Sharon Hodgson's bill. Yeah, I heard that there was a law which was potentially going to be passed about resale of tickets above 10% of their face value. The odds of that law passing in this country are about the same as the odds of you turning on your telly and seeing me playing keeper for Chelsea. <laughs> okay? And I don't even play soccer. Every local place that we go into is the same script. These people get upset. First they say, well, this is illegal. We say, no, 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 we actually read the law. Those wars have been fought. Um, it, the law is not changing in this country. So thanks. Last month in the House of Commons, Sharon Hodgson's bill was dropped. But she says she is not going to give up. Hopefully the reaction from this programme will horrify the public and this would certainly support my campaign for saying that the time has now come that we need to legislate and do something about this. Now, as of this week, the secondary websites were still very much open for business. Even tickets for Channel 4's Comedy Gala in aid of Great Ormond Street Hospital have been listed on some of the secondaries between 65 and £700. Pounds. And that was within a few hours of them going on sale. But during our undercover investigation, we did find one way to get hold of a ticket. At the end of a working day, Viagogo had failed to sell a couple of tickets, so Paul and his colleagues were offered them for free. We have two tickets left. It's scary battle. When is it? <laughs> tonight. Oh, uh, right, I can't go tonight. Uh, what a shame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's scary battle, though. Yeah. OK. For free. It's free. Cool, thanks. That's awesome. So if you want to get a good seat, don't bother logging on. Work inside a secondary ticket exchange.